Good evening and welcome. I am Linda Maroney. I'm the programmer for the One Take Documentary Series and Film Festival at the Little Theatre, and uh, both of which are presented by WXXI. And I'm here this evening to talk about a wonderful film playing at the virtual Little Theatre called Jazz on a Summer's Day. Um, if you haven't seen it, I don't know what you're waiting for, but hopefully you will after this conversation. Uh, you just log into the little.org. It's 10 bucks and half of the money goes to the little and supports them while our doors are closed. So it's greatly appreciated at this time. I am joined this evening with Derek Lucas from Jazz 90.1, John Nugent, and Mark Iacona from the CGI Rochester International Jazz Festival. Uh, welcome, fellas. Nice to be here. Thank you. Hey, welcome. Good evening. It's great to have everyone here. So uh, the format will be, I'll just start talking a bit. I'm definitely the film person here. I do love jazz, but I defer to music uh, to, to all three of you, much more so. Um, and as questions come in, I'll just shoot them out as well. So it'll be a bit of a conversation, not just with me, but hopefully with, uh, with the public watching this as well. So Jazz on a Summer's Day was probably, you know, could be thought of as the first concert film ever. Um, and it's very untraditional for the documentaries that were being made at that time. There's no narrator, there's no voiceover, not telling us how to think. It's very experiential. Um, you know, it was made by two fellas. Um, and one was a, a commercial, Bert Stern was a commercial and a fashion photographer and his eye to detail, you know, and, and imagery treated them almost, treated the images almost like music and sound itself. So it has a very, very different feel in, in so many ways. Um, I wonder if you can recall the first time you've seen the film yourself and what that experience was like. I'll start because I'm the least uh, musically inclined uh, of, of both guys in terms of the history of, of, of the jazz scene. But I remember getting that as a gift from my uncle, uh, my father's brother, who was a drummer. And uh, I was mentioning to you guys before, I was friends with Chuck Mangione. And my uncle, uh, four or five years before I got involved with John and the Jazz Festival, gave me that. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then the relevance of of seeing that and then learning the music business through my partner, John, and then be able to reflect back on that and saying, wow, we're doing something. We're perpetuating the jazz scene that has its ups and downs because of rock and, and disco came into the scene, right? But uh, the relevance of that movie and that festival and what we're doing now kind of like was groundbreaking uh, for us, right? Oh, most definitely. Well, both Derek I and mean, all of us have been to the Newport Jazz Festival. I know Derek and I have seen each other many times there. And uh, for me, I thought I saw the movie, I think, in 99 for the first time in Brooklyn when I was living in Park Slope. And uh, I had known George Ween prior to that. I produced a couple of tours, but I hadn't actually seen the movie. Um, and I mean, it's ha knowing a lot of the musicians in it, having had played with Jim Hall and, you know, I knew Jerry, uh, Jimmy Jufri and uh, I did some bookings for George Shearing just the way all those artists came together on that special day. And it's like that when you see the movie, I mean, uh, Bert Stern is like Linda said, a, a film a photographer and a, every, every single shot in that film could be a picture, you know, hanging on a wall. It's just that type of movie that really is very artistic. And a lot of people don't really think about the uh, groundbreaking music that was happening in the late 50s, you know, obviously Miles and Train and everybody, uh, the Miles Davis sextet and Coltrane and all those great artists were really creating a new style, a new sound. And, you know, groups like uh, 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 the baritone player, uh, Terry Mulligan, Terry Mulligan, you know, what those guys were doing, that, that group uh, was just like really fantastic, you know, Monk, Henry Grimes and Roy Haynes. Are you kidding me? I mean, that was serious, serious music. And uh, in a, such a relaxing setting like that, to be on such a top of their game like that, was really, for me, fascinating to watch. And then to go there and, and feel that vibe. You've never been to Fort Adams State Park in Newport. Wow, it's just, it's a great hang. So that was, it was really cool to see that for the first time. Yeah, same here. I remember watching it back in the old uh, arts and entertainment A&E days where they used to show docs like that. And they showed that film. So I remember I was in my late teens, early 20s. I just couldn't believe that all these people were there at that one place, people getting along. And also, it was one of the first films that showed white people and black people together in mm -hmm. a setting. 
Yeah. And people forget about that. That's the first time people actually saw that on film. People could get along, watch a film, watch music together in harmony. It was really groundbreaking. Oh, that wasn't in the purpose of it, but it was kind of cool seeing that going going on while we seeing the iconic Anita O'Day with that hat that she's wearing and, and all those amazing shots. Like John said, each and every single frame looked like it could have been a postcard of Absol life in the 50s. Absolutely. It looks like it could have been lifted from like Vogue magazine, you know? I mean, apparently he brought in um, a whole truckload of lights for shooting it. He wanted it to look as beautiful as possible. That was his intention at his own, his own dime. Um, you know, and doing some research, it also seemed that that George Ween had wanted to document, you know, over the, I mean, it had only been four years old at that point, but he wanted to document it. But he was really worried about release forms with all the artists and the record companies, right? And so Bert Stern goes, let's just shoot it and let's get releases afterwards. And he thought it would be so beautiful that all the artists would be like, I want to be in that and would just sign off. off. And they did. I mean, that wouldn't happen today. <laughs> No, it would be a lot no. stickier. But the, the thing that was mind-blowing for me, how he did the backlighting, you notice throughout yeah. the movie, the light's shining on from behind, and it gives a different silhouette to the, to the vibe. And I haven't seen the 4K version yet, which I'm looking forward to seeing in the theater when we reopen there. But uh, that was kind of cutting edge, you know, the way he did that. Sure. I was always amazed at the people who did make the cut. Miles, Ray Charles. <laughs> right. Well, they, on the, they were on the program too, right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Because of that, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were shooting on film, so it was a lot more, right. it wasn't digital video at that point. So it was much more costly. Mark can attest to this too. One of the things that George Ween kind of did with Newport, you know, and he's the granddaddy of producers and we all look up to him for how he basically coined the word festival, but how he incorporated uh, R and B, funk, rock, along with classic jazz, cutting edge jazz, uh, cutting edge jazz, avant-garde jazz, you know, experimental music. I've seen everybody at Newport from you know, Henry Threadgill to Art Ensemble to, you know, Maceo recently and Flying the Family Stone back in the day. I mean, he had everybody there. And I said to George, I remember asking him at his office, I said, how do you get away with it, man? Right. You know, you know I've, I've been, uh, Mark, Mark probably as well. You guys, you guys can't call it a jazz festival. Well, he said to me, hey, kid, if it's creative and it's hip, you can put it on a jazz festival. And that's mm -hmm. why he basically was able to do it. Mm. It, was, it was hip, it was trendy, it was fitting the time. People all wanted to hear it. So it didn't matter if it was funk or rock or blues. If it was Frank Sinatra, then followed by, you know, Chubby Checker or you know, Little Richard after uh, Monk or whatever, he would do it. And, and that set him apart as a producer. So we, you know, look, they say good composers borrow, great composers steal. We've stolen some of the ideas and incorporated the way George did it in our festival here in Rochester. Well, I, I like to call it emulate. <laughs> <laughs> well, emulation is, is sort of, you know, emulating is, is good because as an artist, if you're, if you're a trumpet player or piano player, you want to vacuum up all the great styles of your favorite artists and make them your own. So is that emulating or is that borrowing or is it, well, it's not, I wouldn't call it plagiarism because you can't copy someone. You can try to sound like someone. You can certainly try to emulate them like Mark says, but you can also steal their energy too mm. in a positive way and, and, Good artists won't mind. They'll be flattered by the fact that Joe Lovano was my teacher. I yeah, studied sure. with Joe. I wanted to try to play like Joe. I wanted to try to play like Michael Brecker, too, when I was in college. That was the sound. Right. So we all stole his ideas and tried to cop them and make them our own. And that was I got a question cool. for you guys. So for, for a question for Mark and John. So George, throughout the years, did festivals, and of course, in Miami, New Orleans. Of course, New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival is his. Cincinnati, the Cool Jazz Festival. He yeah. tried to do this same model in Western New York a couple of times in the 60s and 70s, but couldn't pull it off. You guys did. What do you think, why were you guys able to pull it off here in Rochester, but not, but George couldn't? Well, there's a little thing that's important. You need backing, you need support. And the guy in the middle of the screen here I'm looking at is brilliant with bringing people together in terms of economics and helping find the funding to cover the cost of staging, crews, mm. licenses, insurances, 
structures, all the things that it's not just all about the music, which is of course what the festival's about, but to, to be able to make it successful, like you say, in Western New York where George didn't, he might not have had the support that we've gotten here. And, you know. Well, I think, well, I appreciate you saying that, John, but I think it's a, it's a whole team. It's you, me, and everybody behind us. But what, what we had going for us is that we were part of the fabric of the community and that in order for something to become a small snowball, to become a boulder that's running down that, that, that mountain, um, that momentum comes from being the fabric of the community and genuinely caring. So what came first with John and I, Derek, is I, George obviously cares about the music and musicians. He is a mentor to many people and, and has helped people uh, in their careers, even when they were down and out. But everyone knew that we were sincere about the music and the creativity and the artists. We, we, we were the fabric of the community, right? And that's, that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, that's why a decision, you know, John said, what do you think about me move? I said, I think it's great if you move to Rochester because now we're, we're the real deal. I'm from Rochester. There's credibility there, but we're not these guys that are in and out of town and gone. Right. And we show up two, three times a year. So I think that's what, really helped propel us going into year four and five was we were part of this fabric of the community we're around we didn't disappear we didn't sit in an office somewhere some people call this crazy by saying you're doing too much you guys should you know be more you know part of the festival and well we are because we're we're helping that team that's behind the scenes um make it successful right so i think it's a combination of of the community coming together and supporting us because we're the fab part of the fabric you know one of the things i wanted to mention was that that film if you think about the people in that film and it's funny you said that derek people that didn't make the cut even the people that didn't make the cut and the people that were in the film how they all affected our world in a certain way not only the music world i mean look at louis armstrong became an ambassador for the united states you know, you talk about now all the things that are going on in, in, in our world. And, and he was an ambassador for the United States in terms of the visibility of our country, right? As a musician, right. as a, I, don't, I, I don't know if we realize half those artists, how they affected the industry and people in the world um, that were in that film. That's what I thought was really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, very much so. So. I, th I think there's been quite a few, though, jazz musicians that have gone out as ambassadors. Didn't D Dizzy Gillespie do tours yeah. of places? Yeah. And so, I mean, there's something to be said of the music itself and, and creating that spirit, I would say. Yeah. Jazz, yeah. Is, jazz is America's only really true art form that we've given the world. And animation. Yeah, the true. The <laughs> two. <laughs> Which also work Absolutely. beautifully together. They do. Absolutely they do. do. But, you know, most of the American musicians, and you can ask any really established artist, you know, I'd call them, there's emerging artists, there's mid-level artists, and then there's the headliner artists in the world of jazz. You know, um, most of the headliner artists make 85% of their living in Europe mm -hmm. because there's 900 jazz festivals throughout Europe. Think of that, you know? There is, every country has multiple festivals, jazz days, you know, and whereas, we have quite a few in the United States, but not as many as Europe does. So, and, and I knew that in the nineties when I was producing my own tours for artists in Europe, you know, it was the way I made my living in the nineties producing, you know, jazz legends tribute to Ella and the Smithsonian masterworks orchestra. And it's how I got involved in Stockholm. It was all European based, but mm. a lot of these artists here, uh, every, all the famous names in this jazz on a summer's day movie, they make most of their living overseas. And that's a fact. So, you know, when you think of the world, like Mark says, Louis Armstrong was an ambassador, just like Wynton Marsalis is today's ambassador to the world for American jazz from Lincoln Center. Um, and there's several others, you know, like Diana Krall is carrying a torch for, you know, the young artists overseas today. Um, I'm trying to, uh, you know, Depending on the genre you're talking about, because jazz is so multifaceted, right. but um, it, you know, these, all these great legendary artists in this movie certainly were very, very, very well known overseas. I've got a question for you guys. So George was in his 20s when he started the Newport Jazz Festival. You guys in your, your mid-30s when mm -hmm. this started, started. For someone, so someone who's like in their 20s or 30s now, what advice would you give them if they wanted to start a festival? Well, you want to go first, Mark? Yeah, sure. 
and I guess you can follow it up from from uh, the artistic side as well, John, because I mean, you did tour and you know what it's like to be mm -hmm. a musician and know what's important to a musician um, when they come into a town. Um, I think it's, it's, it's your, first and foremost, you got to be ready to work uh, 24 seven, not mm -hmm. just for the duration of your festival, whether it's three, five, nine or two weeks. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, preparation up front. Uh, you know, the old saying of measured, you know, twice cut once. And there's a lot of things that seem exciting. Um, and when you hit those first couple walls, you, you don't necessarily are going to be able to go over them. How do you go around them? And um, how do you sustain the energy and the positiveness because nothing's easy. Uh, you know, we have a great team to make things look easy, um, but that doesn't come overnight. So I think it's be willing to do anything that you ask other people to do. And then you have to really remember who is supporting you. Uh, you're under a microscope. We're not perfect. We drop the ball. It's how fast you pick it up. But it's more of do what you say you're going to do because it's the patrons, it's the community, and it's your spots that, that are looking at you to want to be attached to you. So... Mm -hmm. You know, there's no secret formula other than, um, you know, roll the sleeves up, work hard. And then, you know, the artistic direction is really important because you want to have a theme. That's one thing I learned working with John is that if you don't love the music and it's not about the music first, yes, everything's a business. Um, that's going to show real quick that it's not about the music and what we're perpetuate and educate people. And the programming that John does uh, there's a theme to it and and sure you can emulate that but again at the end of the day you have to remember how are you treating all the people that are getting you there uh, and not forgetting that and and making sure they understand how important they are and then the musicians are I don't mean to put it like this but they are your product and you better treat them good and I think John can talk a little bit about that well we always say you know I when I lived on a bus in the 80s uh, we'd show up at you know the, the gig and there'd be a a half rotten tray of deli food and you'd be staying at a motel six and they'd pick you up in a beat up old truck to drive you over to the gig and it just wasn't a lot of respect shown to the artists well when they come here they're our family and they're greeted warmly they're taken care of from a to z they're paid before they play a note they don't have to go looking for the producer or the person who pays the bill to, for their fee at the end of the night they're paid before they play that's our motto and we're one of the only festivals that does that Fortunately, we're able to. Um, I think, you know, uh, the question was, uh, what do you say to young people who want to produce festivals? Well, you know, you obviously need your finances together. You need to work your, you know, your dairy air off 24-7. Uh, Be prepared to fail because we certainly took a few hits along the way. Uh, look at right now. I mean, we're, we're shut down. Uh, all arts organizations worldwide are shut down. We're fortunately able to weather this one. It's a painful blow but we're going to survive and we're going to come back and everybody's, we're going to celebrate the music again soon enough. And, you know, I think as, as a young producer, I took a lot of failure. I happened, it happened a lot of times. I got burned multiple times overseas, you know, uh, turf wars with other promoters in, in Stockholm where they were tearing down my Stevie wonder posters at the Olympic stadium. When I brought them, I, I mean, there, it's just all, you have to be prepared for a sort of a, not a personal battle, but, uh, Believe in, believe in yourself, first and foremost. Understand what the artists need. Take care of them A to Z. Over-deliver, over uh, over under-promise. Give the audience a great value on their ticket price. Leave them wanting more. And uh, if you book artists that you know are going to deliver, and I, I, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back here, but I don't book anybody I wouldn't want to play with. Mm. I don't book gratuitously. You know, it's... It's got, the music has to be really strong. And uh, sometimes I don't, you know, people don't understand the philosophy behind that because they're not in our shoes, you know, but um, we try to be fair to everybody and make sure that when they leave here, they talk about us and want to come back. And inevitably, three weeks after they leave her, they're looking to book for another gig, you know? So, well, yeah. it, it seems like, you know, the artists often come back. So there's something in that, you know, they're, they are want to we come do, back, right? So that's a big thing. There are certainly fan favorites, no question about it. And, you know, and there's some artists that are a joy to work with. And there's some that are fantastic, ridiculously amazing artists that I would never book again. Because, <laughs> right. because there's a lot of other great, amazing, incredible artists who are wonderful to work with. And there's, you know, there's their side of the coin too, right, Derek? I mean, 
Oh, yeah. Everybody's looking for a gig. Everybody wants to play, especially if you have something musical to say. And, you know, what comes out the horn isn't necessarily what the personality is like, uh, you know, on the other side of the instrument. You, you know, look at Miles Davis. Wasn't exactly the nicest man, uh, if you've seen his movie or the movie that uh, Doc Cheetah made of him. You know, not, not exactly the warmest character out there, but what about an artist, you know? And, and, and George Wayne will tell you, he was the most difficult man to work with. That's why he's not in this movie. <laughs> so, so again, again uh, you know, work hard, love what you do, uh, and do what you say you're gonna do, and uh, over, over deliver, under promise, over deliver. That's the bottom line. It's funny you should mention that because we were talking to George. We actually talked. We spoke with his folks to see if he'd come on, and oh. and he decided he wanted. He said, "No, it'd be great to talk about it," but he didn't want to talk about it because it brought back bad memories. Because he's on the film, but sixty years later, he's still hot about it. Yeah, George, <laughs> George's got a bit of a temper, but yeah. but he still loves. But he still but he knows his legacy, and he's very sure. proud of it. And he's ninety four and still working every day. He oh, has yeah. retired. Well, he's. I saw the thing they did for uh, when they had. Um, uh, who's the music director for uh, uh, Colbert? Uh, uh, John Baptiste. John Baptiste did a thing for Danny Melnick at Saratoga. Yeah. And of course, Danny is a very dear friend of both Mark and I. He produced oh, yeah. Saratoga. He was weren't running Newport for George for many, many years. Danny and I talked almost daily. And, uh, you know, he George came on with him on that when they talked about their, I think it was their 30th anniversary. That's That's nice. So, yeah, but he, he's still doing it. You know, and I hope when we're 94, we, we can still talk. Well, I think there's a difference when you're passionate about what you're doing than it being a job, right? There's a big difference. You know, like um, you had D.A. Pennybaker here a few years ago, and he was 87 at the time and still making movies. You know, he was still excited about film. And, and it's a different experience when you're energized about what you love. It's, it's not the same. No you, it's easier to get out of bed in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So going back to the film, are there any favorite performances that you have there or um, in the film or that you've seen at Newport over the years? I, I like, I actually liked Anita O'Day um, only because I saw um, an interview as well within the same few years. She was on 60 Minutes of getting this movie and watching this movie. She mm -hmm. talks about life and she references the music the way um, John and I have had conversations before about the music of a canvas. And she loves that the, the, um, the reason she never went on Broadway or and she never really wanted to go into big bands is because of the structure. Mm. And yeah, as there, there is a little bit of structure and then, then there's freedom. And you know, when she scat, you know, she was, she was awesome, but she talked about the artists she played with, but the way she viewed the music of, of being free, but having your own canvas and, you know, um, it was so weird when I first heard John referencing that kind of a reference. I'm going, where have I heard that before? And, and I remembered it was in her interview. So, and then watching her performances where she's just up there, like, if you want to listen to me, you can listen to me. If you don't, um, I love what I'm doing. And I love these guys that are playing with me. You could see that there was, it was almost, they were all had the same DNA when it came to um, the performance, when she was singing with them, there was nothing, nothing felt forced. Well, well, they were up there. They're, they're having a conversation. I think yeah. you're talking about uh, Sweet Georgia Brown or what was it? Um, yeah. Tea for Two she did. Yeah. It's just great, you know. For, for me, uh, on that film, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, Louis Armstrong with Jack Teagarden, Up a Lazy yeah. River. Rockin', yeah, Chairs, Rockin' Chairs got me, uh, you know, just fantastic, really, uh, you know. Well, I, I'm, I can't even find the words. It's just so emotional. And he, every time I hear Louis Armstrong, I get chills. I mean, you know, it's just, I've had that feeling. I, yeah. I, would, I don't want to, again, you know, here I go. I got a chance to play with Ella Fitzgerald. And did you really? I did. I played with Ella in 1985 in Texas at the, the Fairmont Hotel. I played second alto in the big band at the Fairmont for two weeks, wow. backing her up. She had Tommy Flanagan. And the only other time I get that chilled feeling, in the, you know, like where the hair stands up on the back of your head, She'd turn around after doing Mac the Knife and just go, thank you, boys. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Run off the stage, you know, with her handler. And, and, and I just, what an honor. And I felt like that listening to Louis Armstrong with Jack Teagarden. They love doing that, those tunes so much. 
it gives them such joy and to see the people in the audience grooving on it. I mean, that's how I felt when I got the chance to play behind Ella Fitzgerald. It, that's why we do what we do. That's a good day. It was a great day. It's funny. We, we had a listener and uh, she was telling us she went to the festival in 58 because she went for the first three, four wow. years, 54 wow. to, to 59. She went, she was in college. So that was part of the big college trip before they started schools. They go to Newport. Mm. So she was there at 58 and just said, you, you have no idea what it was like to see Mahalia Jackson. Because a lot of these folks had never heard of Mahalia Jackson before. Right. So that was her right. first, first experience with Ray Charles, Mahalia Jackson, Miles. They, know, they knew Brubeck, of course. But to see that energy come off the stage for the first time was mind-blowing. So just I can't even imagine what it must have been like. For me, seeing Mahalia Jackson, it was just... Wow. Yeah. Talk about a force of nature. Really powerful. So I, I guess she played from 11 to midnight. And, and, and then she did her prayer, the prayer yeah. to, yeah. to bring that it in awesome. Sunday morning. Right. That was awesome. Lord's Prayer, right. Right. Yeah. You know what else we should say, Linda? I mean, you're, you're, you're very close to someone who's in production there. Uh, you know, we should talk about the Arvakians. Aram Arvakian yeah. and George Arvakian. Oh, yeah. Those guys, editors and, and you know, the, the sound and the track, that is a big part of the success of this whole film. I mean, the Absolutely. Guys, especially George and, and Aram. Aram edited it, I believe. Yeah, he did, yep. And uh, I just think that you need to re remember that a lot of these great artists are produced. And these guys, you know, along with Stern, made this film just sort of, it's kind of like what Mark and I do. We propel the artists to get up there, we bring the audience together, and then poof, the magic happens. And that's kind of, I think that's important to recognize the guys behind the editing, the cinematography, you know, putting the film together. Absolutely. And now, lighting is so important, and, and that's the vibe that you catch from that. Yeah, I mean, it's a collaborative sport, you know, filmmaking, music, it's, it's, you know, it's not done in isolation, or obviously it can be, but it's so much bigger and, and becomes something much bigger than itself when you bring other people to it. A hundred percent, yes. The editing is, is super powerful in that film and really, really well done. Yep. Um, so what about favorite performances at your own festival? Oh, wow. And can you pick your own children? I know it's a tough That's one. A real, well, I gotta say, when my my son is uh, going to be eighteen in a couple of days, when he was five, thirteen years ago, sitting on the side of the Eastman Theater stage, waiting for James Brown to walk on, that was pretty cool. I think that was pretty cool, and he gave Jeff, Jess like, "Hey, baby, five, sort of the soul generals kicked off," and I said to my son, "Jess, you won't remember this, but that is a pretty amazing thing that just happened to you right there." And then he goes out and proceeds to bonk Frank the Blaze in the head with his microphone. He throws it down. You know when he did that? There's this yeah. twirl in the mic. That, I'll never forget that. That was pretty cool. Headliner shows. But there are a lot of club stuff that we got about 30 of them. But Mark, what's your favorite? Um, there's a couple of them. And I think one of the most recent ones of the years past are with uh, Joey Alexander and Chick Corea. That yeah. was so special that was the you know the the the, the gen new generation coming up of of you know the just unbelievably talented you know some things you can't teach and even seeing chick korea kind of step back and go wow, wow when he was playing with him that was awesome the other thing that was kind of cool um artistically not a not straight ahead jazz but when um we've had the fortunate experience to have people um um uh, meet during the jazz festival and then become engaged at the jazz festival. So Chris Bodie uh, is, is uh, John knows is a friend uh, of, of ours of mine and uh, I gave him a call one time and uh, a young gentleman that uh, I had gotten to know I, that I said anytime we can help you let me know because I think he was a percussionist. He had called and sent a bunch of emails and I kind of was not ignoring him but I was like I don't know who this person is we get a million emails and finally said, you don't remember me, but this is who I am. I really want to propose to my, my girlfriend at the jazz festival. This is where we met. And I'm like, listen, this is a long shot. I can't promise you anything. So I asked Chris, Chris said, sure. So in the middle of his set, which was a great set when he was playing with, with, with everybody as a great band, um, the, the, the awesome um, concert, 
came down in the middle of it, handed the mic to the to the young man, and he proposed. And the kid did a great job. I thought it could blow up in our faces, and the kid could do something. Right. <laughs> and he did. It was really eloquent. It was great. Matter of fact, Chris, I think, gave the microphone to one of our sponsors, who was like much older. And it, I was like, gave a look to Chris and said, "Not that guy, the other guy." And um, it was just a special moment, you know. And for us to be able to be part of that, John and I have a lot of stories like like that where we've touched people's lives but it's really the event that has so but really it comes down to I think you know all the way from Earth, Wind and Fire like John said James Brown and, and Herbie Hancock but that that Chick Corea and, and Joey Alexander was really cool and having Wynton Marcellus who's a friend and he's been an ambassador like John said but he's also from afar been a been a supporter a promoter of our festival to other musicians and you know having them play but those are the memorable ones. I, I think one more I'll mention too is, uh, and this is, I wasn't sure at the time, but in 2002, when uh, Aretha Franklin came on stage at, at Frontier Field, I introduced her and I said, welcome to the finale of the first Rochester National Jazz Festival, the first of many. I wasn't quite sure, really. But you made that commitment then and there. I kind of did. I said, first of many. So here we are, what would have been our 19th this year. Uh, well, it'll be our 19th next year, I hope. But that was memorable for me to get to play with her and to have her stick the microphone in the bell on my saxophone on the bridge of respect to play the sax solo. That was a highlight for me in the first year. That was pretty cool. You know, she looked me right in the eye. She says, go play, baby. You know? <laughs> All right. We have a first question. Uh, Matt asks, in today's age of different recording labels, rights, and logistics, would it ever be possible to see a film like this made at the Rochester Jazz Festival uh, that shows off the breadth of the festival's acts, venues, and just as much people watching? Or, in your opinions, is it an insurmountable logistical nightmare at this point in no, time? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, well, right now, today, yeah, it would be, I guess, because of COVID. But in a normal world, well, we've certainly done lots of filming at the festival, right. XXI has recorded a lot. And there's been all kinds of footage taken. We do, we do an annual uh, sort of, uh, what do we call it? Our rap film. Uh, we do uh, 90,000 photos and make a real time fast paced kind of film. But certainly we maybe in the 20th year, Mark and I have been talking about a number of things, maybe a, some kind of photography book or possibly a film and it's just it's an economical matter it's a matter of getting the finances to cover cost of production artists are generally fairly good about release rights so to say it's insurmountable no it's not insurmountable we could do it it's just a matter of uh our our, our focus is the live music sure you no know, we're not recording we're not a festival that wants to do recordings all the time uh, not our forte but certainly it's it's in the realm of possibility wouldn't you say mark yeah, absolutely. That's, um, John, spot on there. Um, although times are changing, there may be things that we do that will be a, a certain element of, of recording or on demand in the future, maybe a certain percentage. It all comes down to cost and budget of something that will be able to be on demand through um, a couple venues. Who knows? Uh, again, it all comes down to finances where it not only could be seen uh, that's down. It comes down to artist releases as well, um, whether well, during the festival or on demand after the festival, but not the entire festival. And a documentary of it, yeah, I think we'd be flattered if um, we were able to collaborate with someone where that's something that's in our archives uh, for us uh, to have to hand down to the generations. Um, something that's you know uh, just not to feel good, but something that's documented so that it puts we've. We've been one element to help put Rochester on the map when it comes to arts. We're just one component of the overall success in the history artistically of this community. So to have something of that, that we know that it's like, as, as now from time to time, John and I will say, this is one of our kids and now it's graduating. Um, to have that keepsake, um, yeah, we'd, we'd probably be flattered to, to collaborate with somebody down the road. Right now, again, it's, I'm with it's, wait, it's wait and see right now. Thanks so, for the question, though. Yeah. So it, in the time of COVID, how, how does one, you know, I plan film festivals, but how does one plan, you know, a music festival? How, how and are all those 900, do you think they'll, all those 900 festivals in Europe will survive? I mean. Uh, you know, it's what, very, it's very, it's, it's a scary time for producers right now, Linda. Um, yeah. 
you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball. No, and the world doesn't have a crystal ball. Right. This is the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we're obviously we're nervous, but we're optimistic. I mean, let's put it this way. You just did a 20,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and someone comes along with a backpack blower and blows it all off the table and it's everywhere. And then you gather all the pieces and you put them back on the table and go, holy crap, I got to redo this whole thing again, put it all back together. And someone comes along again and goes, blows it up again. Are you motivated to sit down and put that puzzle back together until you know you can finish the puzzle and yep. vent the puzzle? You know, it's like having a canvas and all your paint is wet and it's not going to ever dry. You know, I mean, I can analogize. We just don't know. And, and <laughs> again, we have to go uh, from a claustrophobic former world, which is now in a germophobic state. We got to get back to claustrophobia again, where we can be on top of each other and feel safe you know, in a small venue where we're breathing on each other and not worried about getting sick and dying. Yeah. So until that happens, I don't see the possibility of really forging ahead and being serious about presenting a program. So we're, we're, in, a, we're in a holding pattern now. We can't land the plane for a while, yeah. unfortunately. That's a great way of saying it. I'd like to be able to say that plane's going to land soon and we're all going to, you know, when we're putting together the program, I say, well, we're putting you on a plane to take you to altitude. And during the middle of the festival, everybody's cruising along. Where, where are we going? Well, we're going to Saturday night. You know, we're trying to get to that Shangri-La artist satisfaction and excitement. Sorry, my puppies are barking outside. But, uh, you know, we will see what happens. We can just hope for the best. Yeah. My battery is about to die. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Good seeing you again. No, actually, there's pasta, and I'm waiting to eat it. So, no, I'm okay. kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just want to say one thing. Um, the relationship that I have with John, uh, how that propelled and, and the passion uh, before I leave, and also the support from WXXI, along the years, that collaboration, 90.1 with Derek and Rob and everybody. And, and then people like, you know, way back when, before I got involved with John to help me know that I was on the track of being drawn to music and doing something in Rochester, like Gat Mangione and Jeff Tyzik, uh, true mentors to me. And then, you know, the all mentor and my business partner in the music is, is the guy that's on this thing right now. I mean, artistically, I've been able to meet a bunch of people that have become friends. Um, and, and before I met John, knowing Winton and his influence. So to young people, Derek, to your question, and I'll, I'll sign off because it is about to go dead. I can see it. Um, have mentors and respect those mentors. And when you hear the truth, don't get upset. Um, help that to pr help that to give you the energy to go forward and be positive. Like John said, believe in yourself. Um, but but you have to have people in your life that can give you the truth, can give you the medicine to tell you, you're not going to want to hear this, but this is what you need to be thinking about, or this is what you might want to change. Um, without those mentors in our lives, and George uh, George Wing was one of John's. Um, you're you're not going to do it all on your own. And we have a great team behind us that we always thank, and our logistics team, our, our transportation team, our, our beverage team, our sub marketing team. That doesn't happen by accident. That, that, yes. that has to be authentic. And when you're authentic, people are attracted to you. So um, thanks for letting me on the show and, and, and being with John here. And uh, um, here, here's to 2021 and staying positive, a vaccine, and then we're all... Uh, Thank We're all you. listening to the creative improvised music. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Right. Enjoy. Uh, right, Thanks, Mark. All right. Stay bye. safe. Good evening. Or dead. All right. all right. Bye. Bye. So I just want to end a little bit and talk about other jazz movies that you love. I'm just curious to hear. Obviously, there's a, quite a few. Um, I'm just curious to, to talk about those for a minute. I, I, I enjoyed Round Midnight, Dexter Gordon's story. Yeah. Of course, uh, I, I, Clint Eastwood's version of Bird didn't really knock me out. I mean, Forrest Whitaker did it. I, I would say it's a very hard pair of shoes to fill, Charlie Parker's shoes. Um, but I, I thought it was cool. I, I thought uh, Don Cheadle's version of uh, Miles's life was, was pretty cool. I mean, it's hard to recreate. Again, like we're talking about good composers borrow great composer steel to, to emulate or to riff on someone's life in the world of music is a hard thing to do, to do it effectively. Um, you know, jazz films. I'm trying to think of some other ones right off the top of my head. Uh, 
Yeah. Round Midnight from Dexter Gordon is probably one of my favorites. It's oh, a great, great one. Really it's a great, great one. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't uh, Mo Better Blues with Dexter Gordon with uh, Denzel. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mo Better Blues. Absolutely. There's, there's also obviously a bunch of docs too. The Thelonious Monk, Straight No Chaser, Let's Get Lost. Um, right. Right. Which is, yeah. other, which is opposite. It's all black and white versus how beautiful and lush. You know, I definitely want you to see the 4K uh, restored version of Jazz in the Summer. Can't wait to see that. It's originally, it's taken from the restorations done from the original camera negative. So it's so vivid and lush. Um, but it's the exact opposite of, of uh, Let's Get Lost, which is so, you know, deeply hued in, in the black and white imagery. There's another great that? film I like as uh, Kansas City, Robert Altman's film. Oh, yeah. Really good. <sighs> but consider the Count Basie band of that time from the 30s. Yeah. It's you know, I went to college. I wanted to be in the Basie Orchestra when I went to North Texas State because I knew, my, well, Mike Williams, who was in the one o'clock band with me there, did end up playing lead trumpet with Count Basie Orchestra. And I, uh, Kenny Hing and uh, I think Alex, uh, no, Billy Dixon, who's the other tenor player in the Basie band back then. But anyway, I, I, I always wanted to play in the Basie band, never got a chance, but Woody Herman was pretty cool. Woody Herman's all right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, did, I did 480 gigs in two years with that band in the late 80s. Oh, so every, I played in every state of the country except Alaska and Hawaii. That was the last tour, right, John? Uh, the last tour that was while Woody, you know, Woody, Woody died in 87, but we kept going for a couple of years. And now it's, I produced 10 of the European tours for the Woody Herman Orchestra. And we went, we went and played at Ronnie Scott's many, many years in a row, mm -hmm. recorded a live record there. And, so uh, the band is kind of, it's kind of a legacy orchestra now. They do the occasional gig. Frank was supposed to have been here with Garzon in June, and he's 91 now. We went to London last September and played at Pizza Express, and we did a Four, mm. four, wow. four Brothers Pizza Seven Express. reunion gig. And that was fun. So uh, we're still trying to keep the music alive and keep it cooking as much as we can. Yeah. Well, those are some movies for people to watch while we're waiting for the next installation of the festival and while we're listening to Jazz 90.1. That'll keep us going a bit while we're living in a different world at this point, right? Yeah. yeah. We're going to come back. It, you know, it, we're going to get through this. It's just uh, it's a slow-moving machine. This thing has you know, it's spread its tentacles. Hopefully, it'll burn out here at some point. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you both for joining me this evening. This was really great to have an opportunity to talk about the film and to talk to all three of you, even though Mark is left. Well, it was <laughs> a pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Well, thank you really for inviting wonderful. us, Linda. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Good night. Enjoy the movie. Bye. Yeah.